Passion 2020. You can be seated. Okay, that was incredible. The Latino Social Club Misfits, I was thinking that um, they need a Greek chick in their lineup. I was gonna get up and start dancing, but my daughters are up to my right and they would disown me for life if I tried to pretend that I'm anything other than I am. Well, I'm so honored to be here. You're kind of finding your seats. What a day. What a way to start a new decade and just what an epic moment. I just want to continue to echo what everyone has said. You know, I was in Copenhagen a few years ago and I was in a cab and as we were driving around Copenhagen, I kept going on about the beauty of the city, how stunning the city was. I mean, the city was so old. I come from Australia, which is just a couple of hundred years old, so there's nothing really old there. But there were buildings and churches that were, you know, over a thousand years old, and there were just beautiful architecture. And I kept saying to the cab driver, this place is amazing, this place is awesome. And being kind of hyper enthusiastic like I am, the cab driver started to cry, not because he was scared that he was trapped in a cab with a weird Greek woman that was going on about how awesome it was, but because he was overwhelmed by how overwhelmed I was about how beautiful his city was. And literally right there in the middle of Copenhagen, he pulled the cab over. I'll never forget this as long as I live. He looked at me, tears streaming down his face, and he said, you know, sometimes you can be living in the midst of a miracle and not even realize it. And it's my prayer and my hope that as we are in this incredible stadium in this moment in history, that it doesn't pass by one of you that we are right now in this moment, in this second, in a modern day miracle. Generations before us have prayed to see such signs and wonders and miracles. And by the grace of God, in the mercy of God, in the timing of God, He has chosen this moment, in this hour, for us to be gathered in one accord, in one place. I know in the book of Acts, when a group of believers were in an upper room, in one accord, in one place, God poured out His Spirit and did something unprecedented. Who could believe that the Holy Spirit of God could do something so unprecedented? unprecedented in this place today that would just blow us away. So Louis and Shelley, thank you for your faith. Thank you for your courage. They dug a well of faith. 1997, stand up if you are 23 years old or younger in this place. Stand up. I just want you to stop. The most iconic arena right now in the world, probably. And when a bunch of people around 2000 <laughs> gathered in 1997, you were not even born. You were not even born. I know Sadie mentioned it. It's just stunning to me. And a bunch of people prayed a prayer then consecrated themselves then, dared to believe God then, and because they did that then and continued to be faithful and steadfast, you are here today. And if you and I have got the faith that our God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond anything we could ever ask, hope or think, then the greatest days of this nation and the world are ahead of us. The Bible says that no eye has seen, so I want you to look around. It says no ear has heard, I want you to hear a sound, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has for those that love Him. Now your eyes have seen an arena full your ears have heard the sound of praise going up in a house like this. And it's entered into your heart what God can do. What was once impossible is in this moment possible. 
We're not even in the faith realm anymore because this is the now realm and the real realm and the possible realm. So I am believing God that into all of your hearts, that God is gonna drop something that is gonna blow your mind. That what God is gonna use you to do, our eyes have not yet seen, our ears have not yet heard, nor has it entered even into our hearts yet, the things that God has for this generation. God is gonna do His mightiest and greatest works in and through your generation, for our generation. I want you to lift your hands to heaven if you want God to use you to do something mighty in your generation. Lord, we're not warming up. (laughs) You've already fired this place up. We're just saying we are willing. Do with us what you want to do. Do through us what you want to do. We are wholly available to you. Father, blow our minds and let your love and grace and mercy flood through this planet because of the faith of this generation of young people who will not sell out to the lie that Christianity is dead, that God is obsolete, that God is disinterested in this world. I thank you for a generation that believes that Jesus Christ is alive, that Jesus Christ loves this planet, and that we are willing to be the hands and the feet of Jesus in our generation, to our generation. Come on, give Jesus Christ an awesome ovation in this arena today, come on, He is one. He is worthy. He is worthy. Hallelujah. You all better sit down so that I can get into my message because we started and you're going to see that the Lord is just going to keep building. That's all He's done. We started with Levi last night and then Pastor John this morning and Sadie and you'll just think that we all sat in a room and that we prepared our messages together. It's how God always does it. And yet we'd never spoken to one another about our messages before this event. This is how you know that the Holy Spirit is weaving everything together. So let's just jump right into Genesis 26. Genesis 26, the Bible says, now there was a famine in the land besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring, I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and I will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring, All the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. So Isaac settled in Gerar. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, she is my sister. Note to all men that are gonna get married, never do this. She is my sister. For he feared to say my wife thinking, lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebekah, because she was attractive in appearance. When he had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of a window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, behold, she's your wife. How then could you say that she is my sister? Isaac said to him, because I thought lest I die because of her, Abimelech said, what is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people saying, whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him and the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants so that the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped and filled the earth with earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. So Isaac departed from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac 
dug again. Everyone say dug again. The wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham, his father, which the Philistines had stopped after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the names that his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of spring water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen saying, the water is ours. So he called the name of the well Essek because they contended with him. Then they dug another well and they quarreled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna and he moved from there and dug another well and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, saying, for now the Lord has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. Now I know that's a lot of scripture on the 1st of January, 2020, but for those of you that wanted to get ahead in your one year Bible reading plan, I've just actually made you go right ahead. So you'll be okay to the end of January. I love this passage of scripture. Of course, Isaac is one of the patriarchs. There's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the only chapter in the Bible that's fully just committed to Isaac. He doesn't get as much real estate as his father, Abraham, that got about 14 chapters, and then his son, Jacob, that got 11 chapters. But there's something very interesting here that I want to focus on, on this New Year's Day for our generation. Now, Isaac, of course, he was there in a time of famine. He was running to Egypt, and God said to him, don't go to Egypt. I'm going to bless you in the land of famine. I want you to know that wherever you are, that's the place that God's going to bless you. You might think your university, your college, your community, your church, your area is a place that is full of famine. But I want you to know that when the Spirit of God is with you, wherever you are, He can turn that desert into a place of blessing and a place of abundance. And so God said, no, I'm gonna bless you right there. And he did. In fact, he blessed him so much that the king freaked out and said, look, I I want you to leave. So he left. And the Bible says he went and he settled in Gerar. And it's so interesting. In this chapter, there's something that Isaac does repeatedly. He went there and of course, you know, Nick and I have just come back from Qatar in the Middle East and I don't know if you've ever been in a desert in the Middle East, it is really hot. And so a well becomes very, very important. A well is literally the lifeline for people in the desert. It keeps families alive, it keeps livestock alive, it it is the source of life. And so when you went into an unoccupied land, you, you dug a well, And that denoted ownership. This land is mine. And then this becomes the lifeline to everyone in it. So the thing that happened is once Isaac had to leave, the first thing he did, the Bible says that he turned up and he went and he found his father's well and he began to dig a well because what had happened The Philistines, they didn't want them to have ownership of these lands. So when Abraham left, they filled the wells with dirt and debris and a whole lot of garbage because they wanted to stop up the well. There was a water supply that had basically taken care of Abraham and his family and his livestock. And there was a promise there for the generations that were to come. But what I... what the Philistines had done was they they preferred to stop up the water supply rather than have anyone else have ownership of this. And so they stopped up the wells. Isaac turns up and the first thing he does is he goes back to the wells that his father, Abraham, had dug. And then he began to get rid of all of the junk that had stopped the water supply. The very first thing he did was dig up his father's wells and he renamed them what his father had named them. Now the Philistines had filled it and you and I are living in an interesting generation where so many wells that were dug before us have been stopped up 
stocked up with secular humanism and stocked up with racism and stocked up with sexism and stocked up with, you know, just atheism and stocked up with lust and stocked up with greed and envy and, and we could just go through a whole lot of dirt that's clogged up a whole lot of wells, a whole lot of religion and judgment and condemnation, a whole lot of stuff that has stop the flow of the water of God. Now, as I unpack this today, of course, I'm not gonna be suggesting that this is what Moses meant when he was writing this about Isaac's well. But there's some imagery in Isaac's experience that I wanna relate to us today in the Mercedes-Benz arena in 2020. There are some things that are relevant from this text and I think we can take from that experience and apply to our lives. And I think there are some things that God wants us to do in our generation for us and for the future generations. And basically today, I'm talking from one subject and I'm gonna challenge a generation that it's time for us to pick up some shovels and start digging some wells not waiting for everyone else to dig them for us, but it's going to take us to have responsibility, to put in the effort to dig some wells. Digging wells is not trendy. Digging wells is really dirty. Digging wells is really lonely. Digging wells is not cool. But if you and I want a source of living water to flow through us into a lost and a broken world, What you and I need to do is be committed to digging some wells. I want you to go with me to the book of John chapter seven. In verse 37 and 38, Jesus said on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He's the key. There are some things from Isaac's experience that we can apply to the things that God has for us today in this century in Christ. The first thing that Jesus says is, if you are thirsty, come to me. He is the source of all living water. He is the source of eternal life. We have heard it. We heard it from Levi. We heard it from Pastor John. We've heard it from Sadie. Everything that we're looking for can only be found in Christ. It's not gonna be found in other people. It's not gonna be found in possessions. It's not gonna be found in titles. Jesus is the living water. We dig our wells because we wanna get to the source Himself, Jesus Christ. We're looking for what we can only get from Him in every other place, which is why we are the most anxious generation there's ever been, why there are so many challenges in our life, because we're trying to get from things and people and experiences what we can only ultimately get from Jesus. He says, come to me. And then he says, out of you. Some of us have got the come to me stuff happening. It's just me and Jesus. I'm just gonna keep going to Jesus. And Jesus is going, that's awesome. But I need you to go into a lost and a broken world, your college, your community. I need you to go so that out of you will flow rivers of living water. Those places are dry. Those places are barren. Those places are full of no hope or purpose or destiny. We are so postmodern, post-Christian. We're so posted. We've been posted into orbit. Our world has lost its mind. It's waiting for a generation of Christians to know who we are in Christ so that out of us will flow rivers of living water into a lost and a broken world. They're waiting for the living water that's in you. But here's my question. That living water flows out of our hearts. How is the condition of your heart? I wonder 
If your heart is as stopped up with debris and junk as the wells were in Isaac's day. Because see, a lot of what stops the the rivers of living water from flowing out of us is our own selfishness, it's our own greed, it's our own lust, it's our own envy, it's our own bitterness, it's our own unforgiveness, it's our own insecurity, it's our own shame, it's our own guilt. And we can get good at playing the Christian game But then we might wonder why rivers of living water are not flowing out of us and transforming the world around us. You know, many of you know my story. You know that I came from a background where when I was born, I was left in a hospital, unnamed and unwanted. My birth certificate doesn't have a name on it. I was sexually abused at the hands of four men for 12 years. Grew up in the poorest zip code in my state in Australia in government assisted housing very marginalized because of my ethnicity. Greeks were incredibly marginalized in the 60s and 70s in Australia. And so I grew up full of shame, full of guilt, full of so much anger, full of so much bitterness. And so God wanted to do a work through me, but he couldn't because The condition of my heart was stopping up the rivers of living water from flowing through me. And there are countless tens of thousands of you in this room that God wants to do an awesome work through you. And you've done the coming to Jesus, but there's a gap between coming to Jesus and the rivers of living water flowing from you. And that gap is often the condition of our heart. And what I've prayed and what I've asked the Holy Spirit to do is to come and do open heart surgery in every single one of us this afternoon. Because some of us are on the verge of a spiritual heart attack. The arteries into our hearts, spiritually speaking, are clogged up. And what we have to do is what Isaac did, and only the Holy Spirit can do that in us, Say, God, I give you my heart. Unplug the junk that is stopping the rivers of living water from flowing through me. On this first day of January 2020, Holy Spirit, would you come and I'm gonna give you permission to come into my heart. I'm not just gonna visit God at a Christian event. I love what Eugene Peterson says in the message. He says, the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. See, a lot of us, we don't want God to move into the neighborhood of our hearts. We want to visit God at a Christian event. We don't want God to invade us and invade our colleges and our universities and our communities. We're like, God, I'll visit you at church. I'll visit you at Bible study. I'll visit you at passion. But God's saying, He's not in prison. He doesn't need visitation rights. You're not in prison. You don't need visitation rights. God doesn't just want to visit. He wants to invade. He wants to permeate every part of us so that out of us will flow rivers of living water into a lost and a broken world. Would you let Him do that today? Would you allow him to come and do what only he can do? No one up here could do this. Only the Holy Spirit of God. I stand here before you because I want those of you in this room that have been abused and hurt and statistics tell us that's tens of thousands of you in this room. I want you to see that there is freedom. You don't have to live bitter You don't have to live in bondage. You don't have to live angry. Your history does not need to define your destiny because of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You can know freedom. You can know healing. You can know deliverance. You can walk beyond your past into the fullness that Jesus Christ has for you. There would be no A21 today. 
If I didn't allow God to come and clean up the junk in my heart, and that has to happen daily. But when I was 22, the age of so many of you in this room, that's where it began for me. My well was dried up. I needed God to come and do a work on the inside of me. To save me for heaven, yes, but also to release me into my purpose here on earth. You can know that deliverance. In a world that cries victimhood and anger, I'm here to declare and decree to you today that he whom the sun sets free shall be free indeed. You can know freedom and you can know deliverance and you can know healing in Christ. You know, the fact is that if you and I are going to be committed to producing that living water, we have to know that old wells can still produce living water. You see, you and I are in a generation where it seems like anything that the generation did before us is not cool. So we've just deconstructed everything and we're throwing everything away. Who needs a Bible? Who needs to pray? Church is just so 20th century. I mean, really, Christine. It is amazing to me. I mean, sanctification, really, Christine? Do we need to be holy? Christine, haven't you heard of grace? Who needs to be obedient anymore? That is just so last century. And we're walking around dying. Evangelism? What do you mean evangelism? Christine, that's a bit exclusive. That's not loving. What do you mean Jesus is the only way? I mean, Christine, we live in a pluralistic world. All roads lead to Rome, isn't it? That is so unloving of you. And Christine, I thought you were into social justice. I cannot believe that you think Jesus is the only way to God. I cannot believe that you think Jesus is the way. I cannot believe that you think Jesus is the truth. I cannot believe that you think Jesus is the life. I can't believe that you actually really still believe that no one comes to the Father but through Jesus. I'm like, people, I didn't say it. He did. I just believe it, and I want to declare and decree it to a generation that is lost and broken. Jesus is the one that gives us a way to salvation through Him alone. But see, a lot of us, we just think we don't need that. That is so old school. So we've thrown out the Word, or we've cut out all the bits that we don't like. I don't like that, man. I don't like that. And because I don't like it, obviously, it mustn't be true then. It's pretty much how we measure everything. Christine, what do you mean, church? You don't know that church hurt me? And so we just throw it away. Christine, the Bible says we're two or three are gathered. It doesn't matter where we gather. We're just going to gather at Starbucks, and it's just me and my friend, and we're just going to have a Bible study. Why should I submit to any authority, Christine? Don't you know? Authority is just so bad can't believe you're going to use the submission word, Christine, and you're a woman. We expected more. It is amazing to me how we just think these things that have been foundational, that have built the church of God on the earth and will continue to, whether we choose to believe it or not. What some of us need to do is go back and begin to pick up a shovel and say, I need to go back to some of those wells that our forefathers dug. We need to name them again and say, you know what? Prayer is awesome because it gets me to the source. Church is awesome because it gets me to the source. Being in the Word of God is awesome because it gets me to the source. Being holy is not legalistic. It's being like God. And I want to be holy because He is holy. Sanctification is important. Evangelism is important. And I am going to dig out the dwell of my Father and I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to stand in the gap for my generation. Yes, we're going to throw away 
legalism. Yes, we're going to throw away misogyny. Yes, we're going to throw away sexism. Yes, we're going to throw away racism. Yes, we're going to throw away lovelessness. Yes, we're going to throw away a whole lot of the things we don't need. But we will keep the foundations. We build our life on the Word of God. We pray to God. We go to the house of God and we build the house of God. And we are committed to becoming holy like He is holy. For without holiness, we shall not see Him. It's not old school. It's Christianity. You can deconstruct what you want, but don't deconstruct yourself out of believing the foundational truths of the Word of God, of the the history of the church of God. Let's make a decision. We are going to dig deep. We're going to get rid of the junk, but we're going to stick to the supply. His name is Jesus. We're going to stick to that. Not only did he have to dig the wells of his father and rename them, and some of you need to do some renaming of some things you've thrown out that are foundational. You're wondering why you're running dry because you've pulled yourself out of the source of the thing that keeps you connected to the supply. I've been in one church for 31 years. You wonder why I'm here today? Submitted 31 years. It hasn't hindered what God has wanted to do in and through my life. It's the vehicle through which I've been released into the purpose that God has for my life. Prayer is a lifeline, not a religious duty. Reading the Bible and building my life in alignment with the parameters and the boundaries of the Word of God hasn't restricted me. It has catapulted me into the purposes of God. We've got to redig the wells of our fathers. The second thing that Isaac did, the Bible says that he dug new wells. And my prayer is that you'll take up the challenge to dig new wells in your generation. Every generation has to dig wells in their generation for the future generations. In Isaiah 43, 18 to 21, Scripture says, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honour me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, that they may declare my praise. So the Israelites in exile in Babylon 70 years felt they had no future. God was reminding them, I pulled you out of Egypt. I parted the Red Sea. I did signs and wonders and miracles. But he reminded them what I did then is nothing compared to what I'm about to do. God's done mighty things. But even as majestic as all of this, if there could be one person in this building that would dare to believe that God could do even more than, than you're worth us hosting all of this for. Because God's saying, even this is nothing compared to what I want to do. Nothing compared to what I've got ahead. You thought this was awesome. I'll just wait and see what I've got in the future. What God has done in the past is not all that God is going to do. How God did it in the past is not the only way that God is going to do it. We learn from the past, we don't live in it. So for some of us, it's time to start digging some new wells. Remember the first thing he did was redig his father's well, so let's get our foundations right. And then from that, let's go digging what the new wells are. The Bible says that God can't put New wine into old wine skin. You're like, Christine, you're missing metaphors, but you know, Jesus turned water into wine, so just go with me. You can't put new wine into old wine skins. There's certain things that only your generation can do. Only you can do. You're the new wine that's going to go into the new wine skin. You've got to be willing to pick up a shovel and dig. I can't dig for you. 
you have to dig. And let me just say, we've got an opportunity in our generation to do perhaps what has never been done in the history of the church. When we talk about the new wineskin and the new wine, the old paradigm that has kept us polarized and divided was either or. Passion is a glimpse of what the Lord's doing with a new wineskin, not either or, but both and. Your generation could take us forward into both and like never before, things that have divided the church and the world. Christine, is a faith or works? Um, both, faith and works. Is it male or female? Both. Is it spirit or truth? Both. Is it young or old? Both. Do we need skill or zeal? Both. Is God blessing attractional or missional? Both. Is it about evangelism or social justice? Both. Is it about gifts of the Spirit or fruit of the Spirit? Both. Is it about grace or obedience? Both. Is it preaching or teaching? Both. Is it house church or the mega church? Both. Is it theological or practical? Both. Is it about our heart or our head? Both. Is it about this earth or the new earth? Both. Is God into counseling or deliverance? Both. Is God into using medicine or divine healing? Both. Is God into discipleship or outreach? Both. Is He into traditional church or contemporary church? Both. Is He into liturgical or non-liturgical? Both. Is He into holiness or relevance? Both. Is He into prayer or action? Both. So the very things that we have used to divide us are the things that say God is saying to a generation, would you pour new wine into a new wine skin and catapult and flow rivers of living water into a lost and a broken world? We've got to dig some new wells because the world's dying. The world's dying, but you're going to encounter resistance. I want you to know that. When Isaac started to dig the new wells in Genesis 26, 19 and 20, he called that first one Essek because it was strife and contention. The second one was called Sitna because there was contention and accusation. But this is what I want you to hear. He didn't sit there in the contention and accusation. Some of you need to get off social media and stop all the arguing and go and dig a new well somewhere else that is gonna bring life and hope and mercy and justice and grace and truth to a lost and a broken world. Some people go, well, Christine, what's the answer in all of the contention in our world? Do I go further right? Do I go further left? No, it's not a matter of going right or left. We've gotta dig deeper. We've gotta dig deeper to the source of living water, Jesus. We need a generation that is willing to stop the arguing and start digging. Start digging deeper. Guys, this is the deal. There are enemies to digging and I'm gonna give you three quick ones. The first enemy to digging is FOMO. I love how Sadie alluded to that today. Our fear of missing out, study after study shows, is killing our generation. Causes so much anxiety because I'm so scared I might miss something. I might miss something. It's not new. Started in the Garden of Eden. Eve was scared. She was missing out. God was withholding something. I might miss out. And that fear of missing out is astounding to me. What happens is instead of digging in the church God's called us, in the youth ministry God's called us, on the campus, instead of doing the hard work of digging, we're scrolling, we're swiping, 
We're competing. We're comparing. We're liking. We're doing everything other than digging. And we keep trying to get some kind of satisfaction from something that is never going to give it to us. You know, if we're in Christ, I think Pastor John Piper said this beautiful, there ought to be no FOMO. Christians ought not to have FOMO. Why? Because as long as we have Christ, we miss nothing. There is no good thing, Psalm 16, 2 says, apart from Him. Nothing. We heard this morning, all joy is found in Christ. We have every spiritual blessing, Ephesians 1, 3, in Him. Ephesians 2, 6, we are seated in heavenly places in Christ. So many of us are like, man, when I get to the top, honey, I'm here to tell you, you're already at the top. You're never gonna get any higher. You are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. We are as high as we are ever gonna get. Our job now is to come into the world and flow from us rivers of living water into a lost and a broken world in Christ. You ought to not feel like you're missing out on anything. Let me tell you, as a 53-year-old woman that's been following Jesus for 30 years, I'm gonna confess to you this morning, I've got FOMO. But the FOMO that I've got, especially as for me, the end is closer than the beginning. My FOMO is a fear of missing out on what God's doing on the earth. I wanna show you. I've got a fear of missing out on the good works, on doing the good works that God has prepared for me. I have a fear of missing out on all the eternal rewards that I could get. On hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't wanna stumble into heaven and go, well, you're done. I have a fear of missing out of all the crowns that are possible to cast at His feet on that day of not living the abundant life that He's called me to live because I'm too busy scrolling through everybody else's life. Of not having Him, of doing a whole bunch of activity here on earth, but not having His presence with me. I don't care how much people applaud me for what I do with A21 or Propel, if God's not in it, I'm not interested. I'm not interested. I have a fear of the fact that I could be in a place like this and God is in this place and I end up like Jacob saying, I didn't even know it. I didn't even know it. Imagine not being ready when he returns. Scripture talks about that in the Gospels and the Epistles. Oh yeah, I live with a holy awareness that Jesus could come back any minute. Imagine not making his last commandment my first priority. I, I have a fear of missing out on that. I have a fear of missing out that I might miss my time such as this because I'm looking at everybody else's time such as this. I'm missing out on becoming holy as he is holy or not seeking first his kingdom or not stepping into what he's called me to do and co-labor with him. We ought to have FOMO, but not a temporal FOMO. We ought to have an eternal FOMO. I think God's hardwired us into us. The enemy's hijacked it through social media, try to get us so consumed on the here and now. Hard to fix your eyes on Jesus when you fix your eyes on your phone. If you elevate your eyes, view our life here on earth from an eternal perspective, it changes everything. Second thing, we fear commitment. See, our FOMO leads to a fear of commitment. <laughs> we don't want to do that because if I pick up this shovel and start digging, what if a better shovel comes? And I mean, Christine, this is a day where I've got apps for everything. There's always something better. I, I, I don't want to commit. We are the most commitment commitment phobic generation. That's what they call us. 
We don't want to commit to anything. Not a partner, not a job, not a church. And Sadie spoke to that beautifully this morning. But our lack of commitment is an enemy to our digging. You know, if I didn't commit to serving in my youth ministry 30 years ago, I I wouldn't be here today. But you know, 30 years ago, I couldn't have imagined this today. If I wasn't doing community-based youth center, there would be no A21 today. But I didn't even know that I would be doing A21 until I was 40. I'm glad I didn't wait till I was 40 to get committed because that's the deal. You can only ever start where you are with what you have. At some point, you've just got to make a decision now. I'm committed and now is when I'm going to do it. There is no way you're going to fulfill the purpose that you profess to want to fulfill if at some point you just do not make a decision that I'm going to start digging here. The greatest gift I think that God gave me is that I got saved before there was an internet. So I just had to pray because I couldn't go online and have a look at what everyone else was doing because I didn't know what they were doing. I was in the back of Australia. I couldn't scroll through social media. I had to get on my face before Jesus. So I... Learned to trust God to open doors that no man can shut. I learned to believe that God, that promotion doesn't come from the north, south, east, or west. It comes from God. I learned to just trust God with the next step and allow Him to open the door. I didn't have to try to market myself anywhere because it's God that lifts people up. And when you get committed to the purpose of God where you are, When you have full skin in the game where you are, God will blow your mind. But when you're using God to get what you think you want, then you're never going to get to where you think you want to be. Driving kids to youth, for all the youth leaders in the room, working in University ministry in Australia in 1996, 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001. I didn't know what God was going to do in my future. But I had fullness of joy there because I had Jesus then. And he was my rivers of living water. And as God has done what he's done with our life, God has continued to astound me, but he is the one that completes me. He is the one that fills me. He is the one that fulfills me. So the same fulfillment I had back then is the same fulfillment I have now. This doesn't make me any more fulfilled. Jesus is the one that fulfills me. Jesus is why I'm doing this. Jesus is why I will continue to do this. If you don't find Him where you are and you don't start digging where you are, then you're never ever going to be satisfied. And when you get to where you think you want to be, you will still be so empty because only Jesus is ever going to fill that need on the inside of you. My time's up, so let me quickly give you this last point. The enemies of digging is FOMO. The fact that we lack commitment. And finally, the fact that we're not patient. <laughs> we lack patience. Man, we, our generation doesn't want to be patient. I mean, we've got news on demand. We have Amazon Prime. I can get groceries just at the touch of an app. Uber's going to take me wherever I want to go. <laughs> Today's world is always about the short term, isn't it? Our financial markets are about the next quarter. Our, you know, fashion markets are about the next season. The stock market is just, it's it's just everything is like quick, quick, quick. Our social media is about the next post. So we have FOMO because this is what drives it. We want it all now. 
But the Bible says in Hebrews 6, 12, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. I'm here to tell you today, faith is not enough to inherit the promise of God. We need faith and patience. You know, we brought in during 2019 our thousandth survivor at 821 through our aftercare program, which was just absolutely stunning. But people say, how did it happen? I'm like, well, it took 12 years and 20 years before that doing a whole bunch of other stuff. You need faith and patience. So you can leave this conference with all the faith in the world, but if you are not prepared to have the patience to turn up and keep digging, turn up day in and day out at college and keep sowing those seeds, turn up at church and keep serving and keep giving and keep opening the Bible and keep believing God and keep praying. It's dirty work. It's boring work. You're on your own. We love this whole arena. But when this thing was a hole in the ground, nobody was applauding it. Nobody thought it was awesome. Today we've packed it out. But you don't know if you start digging a hole in the ground where you are. You begin to put in that shovel and say, God, this is where you have me. I'm not going to wait till I'm there because I am here. So right here, I'm going to start digging. Right here in my college, in my church, in my community, I'm going to pick up a shovel. It doesn't look glamorous. It doesn't look awesome, but I'm going to dig. I'm going to dig out these old wells. I'm going to get to that source of living water and my God is going to use me. Does it take faith or does it take work? It takes both. So Passion 2020, pick up a shovel and start digging wherever you are. In Jesus' Name, in Jesus' Name, in Jesus' Name. If you're willing to do it, I want you to stand to your feet. Don't stand if you're not, because God will call you on this. Spirit of God. If you're able, just as a sign of surrender and you're comfortable, just lift your hands to the Lord as a sign of surrender to Him. Lord, our hands are raised. We say, Lord, take these hands. We're going to pick up a shovel with these hands wherever it is. Our colleges, our communities, our local churches, our families. And Lord, we say that we're committed. We're not going to get obsessed with everybody else's life, that we don't live the life that you've called us to live. FOMO isn't going to hold us back. In a commitment phobic world, we say that, Father, we want to be committed. We have decided to follow Jesus and there is no turning back, none. We will put our hand to the plough and we're gonna follow You all the way. And Lord, we're not going to rush ahead of Your timing. We're not gonna try to make happen in our own strength what only You can make happen. So we say we are submitted to You. We are yielded to You. We say, Holy Spirit, have Your way. And we declare today that we're gonna be a digging generation. We're gonna go back and we're gonna redig the wells of our fathers and we're gonna rename them. We're not throwing out the Word. We're not throwing out prayer. We're not throwing out church. We're not throwing out sanctification, we're not throwing out holiness, we're not throwing out righteousness, we're not throwing out evangelism. We're going to redig those wells in our generation for our generation. And Lord, we say that we will dig the new wells. Not either or, not polarised, but both and and united. And we ask You, Lord, 
do something in our generation that would utterly astound this world. Use us. We will come to You and we will drink of those rivers of living water. And then Father, we believe that Your Holy Spirit will flow through us and refresh a dry and thirsty land around us. In Jesus' Name. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much.